All right, we are live from Eaton Academy. Um, we are just getting started with our first um, Lunch and Learn event. Um, speaking behind the camera is Betsy Pilon, and I am the Director of Public Relations for Eaton. And in front of the camera for our Lunch and Learn is Ellen Titone. Um, who is our director of our Hartman Eaton Center for Teaching and Learning. And um, Ellen has quite the history at Eaton, so she's going to talk a little bit about that. And then we'll get into our subject today of setting a successful start to the school year. Great. Thanks, Betsy. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, as Betsy said, my name is Ellen Titone. I'm the director here for our Center for Teaching and Learning at Eaton. Uh, I do have quite the history here. This is my 20th year at Eaton. I'm so proud to be a part of this community. Uh, my job is a little bit different. Of course, we have Eaton Academy, which is our amazing school. Um, my job at the center is to do things like this, a little bit of community outreach, go into other schools to support administrators, teachers, parents, students, everywhere. Um, just to make sure that all students are really getting what they need when they're in school. They have the strategies, they have the tools so that they can be successful in their learning. So I'm really excited to be doing this. This is a different format for me. Typically I'm giving workshops with a lot of people in a room and I know there's a lot of people out there. So a little bit of a different format, but I'm really excited. Uh, I also wanted to share with you, because I think it would be unfair for me not to say this, is that I am also an Eaton parent. Uh, yes, I've been here for 20 years, but I became an Eaton parent about three years ago. Uh, we made the move because my son just needed a little bit of extra support, um, and I'm proud to say that he is doing phenomenal. Uh, Eaton has delivered on everything that I thought it would deliver after working here for so long, um, getting ready to transition back to a public school next year. So. I, I'm bringing to you, I'm telling you all of this because I think I'm bringing to you the parent perspective. I'm also bringing to you, obviously, the perspective of an Eaton educator. Um, so you have all these different perspectives coming at you this afternoon. So, without further ado, let's get started on this whole topic of setting a successful start to the school year. Um, the school year, oh my goodness, it brings so much emotion, I think, as, as a family, as parents, we have emotions, we have anxiety a little bit about the start of a new school year, who will our students, teachers be, what will that experience be like, I'm going to say welcome to someone, well, hi, hi welcome, come on in, <laughs> have a seat, we just got started, uh, it just, we're talking about just getting into the school year and the emotions that it kind of brings for parents, first of all. Um, I think we're excited as parents when our kids come back because we are looking forward to a new year and our students learning more. But again, there's that little bit of anxiety. Who will my child's teacher be? Will they be able to meet their needs? Will they understand my child and what they need? Uh, so I think our, as parents, we have that. And then we think about our kids. And I think our students experience much of the same emotions that we have. Uh, who will my teacher be? Am I going to be able to handle the grade that I'm going in? Will I be able to handle the classes that I have? And it's, it all kinds of kind of comes back to, I think it's the A word, it's that anxiety, right? Um, and I really believe when we're talking about this topic today, you know, setting a successful start to the school year, the very first thing that we have to do is really think about that anxiety piece. Um, I think that a successful start comes with trying to give strategies to lower that anxiety, to feel good about that start to the school year, and just make it a good one. But in order to do that, we have to give our kids and ourselves some strategies. So that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today is just what kind of strategies are, do we use. Um, and I think the first topic I kind of want to go into is this whole eliminating the element of surprise. And I don't think we view a new school year as a surprise very often, but it is. 
uh, from the very, I just think about our kids at Eaton when they're getting out of the cars on the very first day of school and they're walking up the step. Everything to them, if they either, if they're a brand new Eaton student or if they're a returning student, it's a surprise to them. I heard this year they were walking up and we had some new little um, things hanging that actually are preventing birds from flying into our building. That was a surprise for mm -hmm. our kids. And they wanted to know what that was. And are there more things inside the building? As much as we feel that kids like surprises, many of them don't. That is, we want to try to eliminate as much as possible the unknowns. Because what a surprise really is, is, is an unknown. Um, and I always tell parents, and I try to tell myself, before the school year starts or at the beginning of the school year for the first few months, eliminate as many of the unknowns as you possibly can. Make the unknowns known. So how do we do that? What's the first kind of strategy that we can do? One of the things that I always recommend is calendar everything. Use a daily or a weekly calendar as much as possible. That actually, for students that are here at Eaton, that will actually piggyback off of what we do in the classroom. When students come in, they know exactly what is going to happen that school day. Their advisory teacher is going to say, on the board there's going to be a whole list from 8.30 a.m. all the way to 3.05, what you can expect. We have to do the same thing for our students at home. It's really, really important for us, whether we have a weekly calendar, a monthly calendar, it needs to be visual and it needs to be visible for everyone in the family. An example of this, and everyone always says, well, okay, well, what does that look like? Do you, do you practice what you preach? Do you use a visual, and I do. I really do in my house. One of the calendars that I use is just a dry erase calendar. You can get it at Office Depot, Office Max, whatever. Um, and that's our monthly calendar. Everybody in my family has a color. We are color-coded. I know I am pink. And I put in, everybody's schedule color-coded so that everybody can see the month ahead and it's funny I do I really do do this for my husband and I more than I do my children uh, but they use it everybody uses that calendar it's kind of like our go-to for everything I will say I take it a step further I have uh, quite the span of ages in my house for my children I have a senior in high school I have an eighth grader and I have a first grader so it became evident to me, not so much for my high schoolers, I'll, I'll talk to you about what we do with her in a minute, but for my first grader and my eighth grader, the week ahead became more important than the month because they, they, they could not compartmentalize all of the things in the month. So for them, I actually do every Sunday night what our week ahead looks like. And it's on the front of our refrigerator and like I said, it's got Sunday through Saturday, just that week. And we make actually purposeful times to sit down and go through each day. Uh, it sounds very silly, and it sounds like, oh, that's going to be overwhelming. That's a lot of information. I always say, give them the information because, again, what are we trying to eliminate? The unknowns. Uh, we talk a little bit about who's dropping off in the morning at school, who's picking up, there are no surprises. So that's one system that I, I highly recommend using is just something that's posted in the house. For all of you out there that may have, or you may have an older student, the use of an electronic calendar is a beautiful thing. Uh, we, I've used in the past Google, and my husband and my older daughter is on that Google calendar with us but I just learned of a new one that I'm going to promote. I just started using it, so I can't give you a lot of feedback on it, but I can tell you a friend recommended this to me. It's, a, um, it's called Cozy, C-O-Z-I. And I should have started um, by telling you that all of the resources that I'm sharing during this conversation, we will share out to everybody. So every, please don't feel like you have to frantically you know, scribble it down. I'll send it to you in the end, okay? But C-O-Z-I, Cozy. It's an app, and it's an app that every family member can have, and it's the same type of thing. You can color code everybody in your family. You can print it out 
It's just an or way to stay organized and have everybody on the same page with what's happening. Okay? So strategy number one, we're eliminating that element of surprise, keeping a calendar. Okay? The second one, and I know again this may seem a little bit silly, but it's establishing routines. If we think about what our children transition from, from summer to the school year, they go from summers, most of the time summer is pretty, it may be structured, but it's a little bit more unstructured than what they're doing in school. They're going to school and they're having a very structured day, every day, from about 8.15 a.m. to 3.15 in the afternoon. So that's a big change. Kids thrive on routine. So the more routine and the more we can actually implement that in our home, the more stress levels will come down both for them and us. So one of the things I always recommend is establish AM and PM routines. That's when we see our children, right? Um, I actually printed out, and again, this is a resource I will share with you. This is something that it may be, I'm gonna put this on the back of the purple, so let's see throw up. This is something that is for younger students, obviously, but I still recommend this for students that are older. Betsy, are they, can they see this? Uh, yes, and we're gonna post this afterwards as well, yes. so. Right, great. Um, a morning routine, and I will say I have started using this with my six-year-old. Uh, I'm trying to establish a little bit more independence with him, but he knows that this is his little checklist. He gets up, he makes his bed, he gets dressed, we eat breakfast, etc. For each thing he does, he gets a sticker. Six-year-olds love stickers, right? Um, and we do the same thing in the evening. These are all the things we have to do, and we get a sticker for each one. Great strategy for younger students. It's a great strategy for students through middle school. Middle school, we use checklists in my house. My, my middle son has all of them. Most of the same things on here add a couple things like homework, but he has his checklist that he checks off, and he's told me, Mom, do you know how good it feels? At the end of the day, when I can just make those checks on my checklist, I've accomplished it. Yeah, because I have checklists too as an adult, right? So establishing routines, I think, are so very, very important. It's also really important that we are making sure that those routines are the same, even if maybe the after-school schedule switches around a little bit. So let's say we have extracurricular activities that we're doing in, in the evening or in the afternoon after school. Making sure that those routines still are in play, even if we get home a little bit later than usual. You're still gonna have to do the same things. You're still gonna have to complete your homework. Maybe it's just a little bit later. And actually walking our children through that, I think is a really good strategy. I just brought up extracurriculars. And that's the third thing that I want to talk about when we're discussing just this, ele this element of surprise or the unknowns. I believe, I think that all parents, um, I've talked to so many parents about just extracurriculars and what is the correct number. And as a parent, I, I've been through the same thing with my husband. We talked about well, what, how many extracurriculars is too many or is not enough. Uh, and I think that that's a question that's different for every child, uh, but I will say this, I think that we as parents need to be cognizant of the number of extracurriculars that our children are involved in after school. Uh, I will say that for my middle school son, if we really are starting to take into consideration the amount of homework that's increasing as he gets older, uh, you know, and his interests. Extracurriculars obviously should always, always revolve around what they're interested in doing, and I fully believe that. But I have had to have those hard conversations with, with my son and say, okay, you really need to choose only two. Uh, this, is, this is how much time we have. You have homework responsibilities. We need to choose two this school year and stick with two and see how we handle that. So I brought that out there just as a little warning, not even a warning, just a, in the back of our minds thinking how busy are our children after school and how many times are they switching from one extracurricular to another. I think it's very important for us just to keep that in mind as we, as we focus on the new school year. Uh, not so far. So if you um, have any questions on this first part of content, 
about um, the daily weekly calendar at home, daily routines, bedtime, number of extracurriculars. I'll ask if do you have any questions. Well, I was wondering what format you use for the checklist because my son's in middle school, so I would do the checklist. Mm -hmm. um, I used to do something similar. He actually had a laminated card with a list yeah. when he was younger, mm -hmm. and it was very successful. And now when he forgets things, he said, why don't I put together like a list? And he's been pushing back on that. And he says, Mom, I'm not a little kid anymore. Right? He sees that. Yep. You know? And the thing is, it's like still, I think it's a good thing for him to have. Right? And I want to put it in place like in a grown-up way. I think you bring up the best point about all of these strategies that we're talking about. And that is... What works for one child may not be the strategy that's the best one for another. And my son and I had the same conversation because he was pushing back on the, the babyish sort of checklist yeah. that we were using. And he had the same thing, laminated in his binder, yeah. same thing. And what I did, I, I sat down with him and I said, did, it's actually analyzing the strategy. Do you feel like the checklist actually worked for you? And my son's answer was, well, well, yeah, I got everything done. And I said, perfect. What mode? I want you to create a method that you think will work better for you, whether it's what, whatever, whatever way you're going to keep track of doing all of these things, I'd like you to brainstorm and come up with what that looks like. And let's give it a try. You're right. They're at that age where they're becoming more, and we want that. Yeah. We want them to be independent in those strategies. But at the same time, it's us closely monitoring. And it was me, I circled back around. He said he preferred doing it on his iPad. You know, he has his iPad at school. He uses it to track his assignments. It just made more sense. And he said, I want to try to do it on my iPad. Perfect. Well, I circled back around. I gave it about two weeks. And I circled back around. And I said, OK, how is that going? It's, it's we, we talk about this at Eaton all the time. It's, it's just thinking about what we're doing. It's, it's really thinking about how we're doing it, thinking about our thinking and how we're doing things, the processes. And I went back around and said, is it working for you? And he said, it sort of is, but I sometimes forget to look at it. And the paper copy was always there. And I'm like, well, what, what changes do you feel you should make? He went right back to what we were doing. But he, he went right back to what we were doing. It wasn't me telling him. And I think giving our older students that power to kind of figure out what works and doesn't work is, is number one, empowering for them, but for us too, right? Yeah. It's, that's what really what we want. We want them to be independent learners. So giving, giving them the options, you know? Showing them, even going online and Googling some of the ways that you can do checklists and saying, you know, what, what, what do you want to try? Let's try something different. Yes, yeah, he has he has his iPad, obviously. But yeah, and, and he would he would love something on there. So I think that would be worth trying. Yeah, you can pick something and format it because he loves to do the formats and then see. Right. Yeah. And the cool thing, what I I kind of gave, if there are other siblings in the family, I always say, um, you know, if this works for you, I might try this with your little brother or whatever. It, it's it's again every, anything that we can do to empower and and if it doesn't work, that's okay. That's actually great because you were really analyzing this is a strategy that didn't really work for me. I gotta move to something else. That's that's magic. That's awesome. Yeah. So give them the power to do that. Cool yeah. question. That's yeah. a great question. <laughs> Perfect. Great. Any other questions before I um, Not from the peanut gallery, so. <laughs> okay. All right. So the second piece that I really want to focus on, and I know that um, this is the piece that brings a lot of anxiety, I think, to parents, is the parent-student-teacher relationship. It's that relationship with that new teacher, and I touched on it a little bit at the beginning. Um, that relationship, and I always say it's parent-student-teacher is vitally important, and we all know that. Uh, that teacher, I went to my own son's curriculum night a few nights ago, and we have curriculum night tonight at Eaton, and I hear the same thing every time I go, that it is vitally important for us to be connected, for us as parents to share information, just as important as it is for the teacher to share information with us. It's, it, I hear it every year, and as an educator, I know this, I was with children every day, 
The teachers see our kids more than we do during the school year, during the day. Think about that. So, you know, if I kind of reflect back on my own teaching practices and now as a parent, I really feel as parents, we need to give those teachers as much as we possibly can at the beginning of the school year about our students. We need to give them information about our kids, even if they don't ask. And I know that sounds silly, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, one of the things that I have done is I actually started, and this, this started with my son, who goes here at Eaton. Um, he, they always do at the beginning of the year, a lot of teachers do all about the inventories. Who are you? What are the things that you like, et cetera? I always have my, my son or whatever fill out one by himself. And I'll say, did your teacher ask you any of these questions yet? And if they didn't, you know, you might want to, you might want to give them that sheet because it tells them some really, really good information about you. Now, does he do it? I'm not sure. <laughs> but what I'm actually working on is self-advocacy. I, I am actually helping my son, my daughter, my sons develop their relationship with their teachers. And I think that that's really important, that they have that relationship as well. As a parent, I do always start the school year, and I don't do this at curriculum night. That's a, you know, curriculum night's not the time to talk about your student. But I'll always say, a, send an email at the beginning of the year. Super excited to meet you. You know, I, you know, say a little bit about my child. These are the things that, um, he or she, I've noticed, have worked really, really well in the past. I think that I had a friend one time, and I'm going to tell you this little story. I had a friend one time tell me, I just feel as though if the teacher can't figure out what my child needs, then they're really not that great of a teacher. And I, it made my, my stomach turn a little bit because I said, your teacher, the teachers are going to do everything they possibly can to figure out what your child needs. But why aren't you supporting that process by saying what they need in the beginning and eliminating the reinvention of the wheel, right? Trying to find those strategies again, when as a parent, you know the strategies that work. So in that welcome email that I sent, I always will say, just to let you know, he always has a fidget in his hand. It's a really good tool for him to use. He will be paying attention to you, but having something in his hand is a really good strategy for him um, to stay focused in your classroom. Little tips about your child go a long way. And I have never once had a teacher email me back and say, I didn't need that information. <laughs> and as a teacher, that's information that I, that I wholeheartedly welcome every single year. So making sure that we're really uh, giving the information that our teachers need about our students. Have them fill out an inventory. You fill out an inventory. Strengths, uh, areas of interest, weaknesses, and then again, what I just said, strategies that really will help support your student in their learning. Those are the things that you're looking for. And again, we will share out uh, after this video what I just said, okay? The next strategy that I think is really important for us as parents, and I know we're really busy. Right? We have people working parents, we have um, things going on with our other children. Attend everything that you possibly can at the school that your child attends. Uh, again, I'm going to say from you know a parent who has three children in three different schools, I know it's really difficult. But become a member of the PTA or whatever association it is at your school. Um, attend curriculum night. Go to conferences. Be visible. Sign up for that field trip that your child is taking, even if it's just one time of year. Your presence is really seriously supporting that parent-student-teacher relationship. Just being present. I think is super important for us. Um, the third thing, and again, I think this kind of goes hand in hand with everything else, is advocate. Uh, I know so often, and again, I'm going to flip back to being my, a teacher, so often parents did not want to come to me with something that either occurred in 
their students learning or occurred during the school day because they thought it really wasn't that important. I think that one of the things that's so important for us as parents is to be our child's best advocate. And it's, I think we have to remember when we are advocating that it isn't the relationship between the teacher and ourselves, but we have to include our student in that advocacy. I think it's really important for us to teach our children how to self-advocate, how to approach the teacher when there's a problem in the class, how to talk to the teacher or express a concern appropriately. And the way that they really can learn that is through us. Uh, how do we approach the teacher? What are we talking about with the teacher? Um, reminding our children that the relationships that they have your relationship with the teacher is not just a teacher and parent, but they're included in that. So as much as we possibly can, and as much as it is age and developmentally appropriate, we need to be including our children in these conversations because again, ultimately, and we said this before, we're striving toward independence. So ultimately, when our children go to college, it's not gonna be the parent-student-teacher relationship, it's gonna be the student-teacher relationship. We are the role models right now to show our children how, what that looks like, how that looks, what do those conversations look like. So start right away. You know, as soon as something comes up, we're gonna talk about that with your teacher. We're gonna sit down and have those conversations. That was a lot of information in 30 minutes. <laughs> do we have any questions, first of all? Um, I haven't seen any come through, so um, we've had about, you know, 15 people joining us virtually. Obviously, we have one in person as well, um, and really, um, we're hoping that these will take off, and um, there will be, you know, additional topics for any of these monthly, so we always invite people to come in for lunch, um, and we will also invite people to join us virtually for these. Um, so I want to thank you, Ellen, for, oh, see if there's, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Ellen, for joining us and for you joining us in person and all of our virtual followers. Um, I have included a link at the bottom. Uh, just a quick, just 
if you're interested in getting um, paper or printable resources that Ellen presented, um, there's a quick sign up for those that we can email those out to you. And then, um, you know, just let us know. There's also a section in that quick uh, Google form for topics you may be interested in having us present on in the future. So just take a look at that Google form um, and give us that feedback. We look forward to the next one. Our next one is October 8th. Uh, next month, and it is with Mary Beth Casey, our College and Life Prep Director, and the topic is planning um, college for your student who learns differently. All right, we'll talk to everyone soon. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.